Welcome back to another episode. I'd like to talk about divorce. Um, divorce is pretty common in our society. And I think I've mentioned on the podcast before that it was my divorce that actually launched me into doing this work, uh, which has ultimately resulted in financial therapy. Um, and so there's a lot of things we could talk about with, with divorce. Um, I want to focus on more of the uh, financial impact and a lot of the emotions that are underneath the financial impact. As we've talked a lot about, it's really hard to separate emotional well-being from financial well-being. So a divorce is uh, much more than just a termination of the marriage uh, partnership. It's really a major financial event that can have repercussions in a person's life for many years into the future. Now, it, it's... Um, it can be more of an impactful event for a couple that have accumulated some things, assets along the way that whose careers have expanded than say a very young couple just starting off who are in the very beginning parts of their careers and really haven't accumulated much. So there's, there's definitely a continuum of this. But I think it's important to think about the fact that a divorce is um, similar to a dissolution of a business. It's a situation where a partnership has failed, and part of that partnership has been the joining of financial resources that now need to be separate are separated. So it's uh, uh, two people who are financially separate coming together. They throw everything into uh, one pot, um, if not actually, because some, some couples do keep things separate, but certainly legally, and then having to untangle all that with the, the split. And I've said this before, that there's nothing that's a greater threat to financial well-being than divorce. It is the number one uh, destroyer of financial resources. Uh, the only way that it really may not impact a person heavily financially is if they are very wealthy. Uh, take Jeff Bezos' divorce, um, or very poor. So for most people, we live between those two extremes. And here's the reality. The reality of divorce for most people means that your lifestyle will almost certainly decline. Um, so that, that's what I, uh, what I want to talk about. We know that the chances of divorce are 50-50, about 50% uh, of all the couples that get uh, married divorce. We have the second highest divorce rate in the world. And you can learn a lot more about all the statistics with divor divorce if you want to go to worldpopulationreview.com. And according to their data, second and third marriages have an even higher divorce rate. 60% for second marriages, 73% for third marriages. Um, 
Now we could speculate reasons why that might be. Um, one reason that I might throw out is that perhaps the majority of people that get remarried don't work through the underlying uh, emotional issues, the traumas, uh, the unfinished business that contributed to their 50% of the breakup of the first marriage. Um, I think I was fortunate somehow <laughs> in that uh, because I, I said a divorce kind of led me to where I was and for some reason I had the insight to think, you know, if I don't change or take a look, at least a look at the dynamics that were present in my first marriage, I am probably doomed to repeat them over again. And um, this was before I ever uh, got into counseling, recovery, therapy, anything like this. So <laughs> I am appreciative to that insight that came to me because I, it did not come from any of my uh, experience. So, uh, and here, here's some other interesting statistics that I came across um, in kind of researching this. Who's at highest risk of divorcing? Well, if you were married between the ages of 20 and 25, are not religious, and don't have a college degree, you are in one of the highest percentiles for a potential divorce. Those in the lowest percentile of divorce are just the opposite of that, right? They waited to be married uh, past 25, they're religious, and they have a uh, graduate degree or a PhD. The higher, it actually found that the, the higher your level of education, the less chance you had of divorcing. So uh, uh, the other thing I found interesting was according to the U.S. Census Bureau survey, the top three reasons for divorce are, number one is incompatibility, which is a real catch-all phrase for all sorts of things. Number two is infidelity. And number three are money issues. So I have a hunch that sometimes when listing incompatibility, it could um, <clears throat> include elements of infidelity and elements of money issues. So with that background, I wanted to relate um, a story, an actual story that I came across recently about uh, Kristen. And um, Kristen had largely been a stay-at-home spouse. She had a career that she put on hold to uh, raise their son. Her, her husband, they decided her husband would continue to be the main income. Kristen maintained a little bit, very part-time job. But for the most part, she was there uh, for her son uh, during his growing uh, growing years, and uh, the, the son was uh, eight years old at this particular time. Um, she received some child support from her former spouse, but it wasn't uh, near enough to support uh, her and her son. So when the divorce happened, she had to return to full-time employment, which meant to the eight-year-old that 
mom wasn't as present in his life as before the divorce. Well, it just wasn't an option after the divorce for Kristen not to work. And, and we talked about that, that. One of the things that usually happens with a divorce is a reduced lifestyle for both spouses. So not working um, was a gift of the, uh, of the marriage, of the, the partnership, to be with the, the, or her son. So going back to work presented a number of emotional challenges for Kristen. First, she loved her work, and she also loved her son. So you can see immediately that there's a polarization um, around that. There could easily be guilt on both ends. Guilt that she loved her work. Guilt that she wasn't being with her son. Um, and guilt like this can really pop up and 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 be manifested in a number of different ways. For example, it would be very easy for, for Kristen and her ex-spouse to potentially shower the, uh, their son with gifts um, at birthdays or Christmas out of guilt, just out of guilt for the uh, consequences and the impact of the divorce on the son. Um, so this can go pretty pretty deep when we have this type of polarization. Also something else that was up for Kristen is that as a child she had made a commitment to herself to be independent, to provide for herself so she would never be controlled and dependent on a partner. Now, this could have come from a number of different things that she witnessed as a child in um, probably the relationship of her parents or the actions of a caregiver. Um, so this was, this was really important. There, there was some real wounding there, right? Whatever she witnessed to decide she would never be dependent on somebody for her support. So you can see that when her son was born and she and her husband decided it would be best for her to reduce her hours at work, to stay home with their son, that that, that was really difficult for her. Um, I don't know how she, she dealt with that. I don't know um, exactly everything that she had to go through you know, to potentially cope with that. But that was a real um, uh, dormant money script that was lying there that you don't want to be dependent on anyone for your money. So um, that, was, that was definitely a fear for her that was triggered by the divorce. Uh, and then having to go back to, to work. So when, uh, when she went back to work, it wasn't enough to sustain their lifestyle, right? So, of course, there was, uh, uh, as part of divorce, as there is typically, there was child support involved. So between the child support and Kristen working, she could basically make it financially for her, for her child. So things really uh, got triggered one day when Kristen's ex-husband came to pick up their eight-year-old son. And he was going to go away for his annual two-week stay with his father. And as their son was getting ready to walk out the door with dad, her ex extended his hand to her. And in his hand was a check 
and he said, here is your check. Their son looked up at Kristen and said, oh, so daddy pays you. Now, uh, um, seemingly innocent exchange here. Um, when her son innocently said, oh, so daddy pays you. Those words cut deep for Kristen and instantly accessed the plethora of thoughts and feelings that you might imagine it, it would based on my, ex, uh, my setup here, uh, facts around Kristen. The other thing that was interesting is this is the first time he had ever just handed her the child support check rather than mailed it. So fortunately for Kristen, she had a financial therapist in her life that was able to help her unpack and process all of the emotions and the beliefs and the money scripts that these innocent words of her, of her son brought up. And what did she find in all of this? Well, she discovered that a part of her was really angry, hurt, and feeling shame that she could no longer be at home with her son because she had to work. We talked about that polarization between loving her son, loving her work, um, being angry now that she had to go back to work. And there could be even some guilt that she's going back to something that actually she, she really enjoys. There could be shame around that, that for some reason she was selecting work over her son, even though another part of her knew, knew she had to go back to work. Um, she became aware of the anger around the deep hurt that she still felt around her husband dissolving the marriage. It had only been about a year that uh, they had been divorced. And under, under that, uh, of all that, there was the hurt around her husband dissolving the marriage. And then she was able to see that she carried a lot of shame from her contribution to the marriage failing. Now, obviously, for Kristen to see this, uh, she had been doing some work on herself because this is a, a tough thing for us to, to, to see. Like I said, um, we are all 50%. We're all... the. Uh, we are all 100% responsible for our 50% of the relationship. So she still felt a lot of shame around the things uh, that she contributed to the dissolution of that marriage. So that was triggered by, oh, so daddy pays you. Um, also with her financial therapist, she unpacked another part of her that was triggered that fears of being dependent on anyone uh, really didn't feel safe to her. So this part really wanted to work at her job really hard, do really good, get promoted, make a lot of money. So she didn't have to depend on her ex for child support anymore. Uh, the way she put it, and this way, if I could make a lot of money, I wouldn't even have to deal with him. Um, and uh, you can imagine still the hurt of that, that breakup being under that. So I don't have to deal with him. Also the shame of being dependent on the child support played into this. Um, there's still another part to unpack. And that was, uh, there's a part of her that interpreted 
the words of her son to mean that her son thought her ex was fully supporting them. Now, um, I, I don't know what the, the eight-year-old boy thought, but that was an interpretation of those words that a part of her made. Well, what, what, did, what did that do? Well, based on her history and her story, this left her feeling minimized and unseen for her contributions. And without her wage, without her working, which was the major part of their income, she and her son would not be able to survive. So a big part of her not feeling appreciated for the contribution. And um, having this need to be seen <clears throat> by others who, if you think about it, really were not in a posi position to see her. An eight-year-old child doesn't see that, has no capacity really to see that. And her ex-husband, um, you know, probably highly unlikely that he's going to be really sensitive and supportive and see uh, the, the um, contribution that she's making because I could make up a story that he's having uh, all sorts of potential shame and guilt around uh, um, divorcing his wife who now has to go back to work full time and could be uh, barely making it. Now he wouldn't necessarily have to feel that way, but 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 that that could be part of it where he just couldn't couldn't uh, see her or validate her in that. Um, so a lot, a lot to unpack from a simple little statement. Oh, so Daddy pays you. And this is, this is true for, for life, right? I mean, uh, it's amazing that we communicate at all because what a little tiny tip of a huge iceberg. So the, the question became, what should she do when her son came home from the two weeks? What would be uh, appropriate? Well, the good, the good thing is Kristen dealt with this before her son uh, came home and really unpacked it and was able to see all the parts of her that were hurt and shamed and angry and, and all of their good intentions of keeping her safe, uh, especially all of the, the, the managers and, and protectors that uh, she had up using IFS speak. So when her son uh, returned home, this is what she uh, decided to do. She wanted to give her son some information around the check that daddy gave her. Um, so the first thing that she did was explain to her son that mo both mom and dad love him very much and that they both contribute money to being sure that he has food and clothes and a warm bed to sleep in because they love him. Um, she had uh, processed with her financial therapist that um, probably she didn't want to say, well, daddy writes checks because he loves you because it was important to bring out the fact that they both were contributing to uh, his financial well-being. And it probably wouldn't be um, advisable to say, well, <laughs> daddy's check is a whole lot smaller than mom's contribution, which would have been uh, a sideways um, uh, manifestation of the anger that she would have within for feeling minimized 
and not not supported and angry about the divorce, etc. So um, uh, she explained to him that that the check that he saw Daddy give Mom was uh, Daddy's share of the, that contribution. And then she also made it a point to reassure him that she is sad that she can't be at home with him as much because she does need to work, but that she loves him very much. And that the reason that mom's got to work has is not his fault has nothing to do with him. And the reason she decided to do this is oftentimes kids will take on, especially in the divorce, that it was they were the cause of it. Now, it's highly possible that Kristen had already had these conversations with the, the with him that um, it wasn't his fault that that daddy moved out. Um, that mom had to go back to work, but it's it's um, probably never an error to reinforce those and just make sure that he understands that both his parents love him and that um, it's um, uh, their their joy to provide for him and it's not his fault that they don't live together and that mom works. Um, so I think uh, uh, a lot of us can relate to how healing that type of response can be to a child. And I, I don't uh, suggest in, in her response that this was the best response. Um, or that it couldn't have been different. There's probably unlimited things, unlimited ways that she could have responded to her son. But the important thing was this. Uh, she was given the gift of time to unpack all of this before she needed to respond to her son. And she didn't sweep it under the carpet. She didn't leave that hanging out there so her son could develop a whole story around daddy paying mom and what that means and that become part of his financial trauma, his money scripts that he would take into adult life. So um, he was very, uh, very fortunate <clears throat> to have a mom that was uh, really sensitive to that and um, did her very best to own her part of all this, take a look at everything that was happening emotionally for her, and then have an appropriate discussion with her eight-year-old. Um, and also, it, what you say to a child is very dependent upon how old they are. Uh, you probably would have hand, handled things with a four-year-old differently than an eight-year-old, differently than a 16-year-old. So nobody ever said parenting was easy or um, <laughs> not for the faint of heart. So, all right. Well, thank you for joining me. Uh, take care. Look forward to being with you next week.